welcome to a special edition of The Dirt, an FCA podcast presented by Netting Professionals. We've got a fun one today. We're going to continue Title IX education, the quest for gender equity and more. And we have Judy Garman and Joanne Graff with us, um, two fantastic Hall of Famers that we're just thrilled to have join the conversation. They have unique experiences and I can't wait to hear their stories and pieces of advice. So less of me and more of them. Coaches, for people who don't know you, let's just do a little introduction of maybe how your career in athletics started, how you fell in love with the sport, a little bit about your coaching background, and then what you're doing today as much as, much as you, know, you can with Judy and golf. I'm just jealous. Uh, so Judy, why don't you start us off a little bit about yourself? Well, I was really lucky that I grew up in Western Canada where it was a European sports philosophy and girls were treated like boys. I mean, our track teams were boys and girls combined. You just total the score. Basketball, we played double headers with the boys and the same cheerleaders, the same concessions. So girls were not second class. And when I came to Santa Barbara for my master's degree, I was shocked uh, to see how few opportunities there were for girls and women in college sports or even in high schools. And one of the shocks, I came to Santa Barbara and I was proud to wear an athletic jacket that I had. And some of the other people in the major said, I would suggest you don't wear that jacket around here. And I go, why? And they said, because of all the negative concepts, people just, it it just won't do you any good. Just don't wear athletic stuff around here. Even though I was a PE kinesiology major. Uh, So that was a shock. But growing up in Canada, we had all these opportunities to participate. uh, And I played Little League Baseball until at regionals when they kicked me out because I found out I was a girl. Um, And then I was able to play on a women's sports softball team starting when I was in junior high school. And uh, it led me to want to become a coach. I had a dream. I wanted to be a big time coach, live in a big city and drive a sports car. And those dreams came true. Uh, and uh, I ended up in California with all kinds of incredible opportunities. So I'm very grateful for the journey that uh, I was able to be a part of. Uh, it's exciting to see where softball is today, but it's also frustrating as we'll get into later to see some of the things that are now still haven't changed or, and still need to improve. Absolutely. She, she glanced over her coaching accolades um, fairly significantly. We'll fill those in a little bit later, uh, Judy. But Joanne, how about you? A little bit of background for those who might not be as familiar. And how did you get involved? Okay, well, I was kind of the opposite of Judy in that I grew up in Florida. And there was that discrimination kind of you had to fight for the right to play. And, um, you know, of course, I always played in the neighborhood. But in high school, they only sponsored two sports for women and it was tennis and track. So we played volleyball, basketball and softball. Each high school had a team, but we had to play through the recreation department. Um, You know, so you had that kind of angle. And uh, then at Florida State, I also went to Florida State as well as coach there. Um, You know, it was pretty interesting because of course it was pre-scholarship days Um, And I was kind of there right when Title IX was getting passed. So I was at FSU from 71 to 75. But, um, you know, it was kind of interesting. And I just love the sport. You know, I thought I I was good at it and liked it. And uh, so I played on the the, uh, team and we got would get kicked off when men's intramural started. We were on play, you know, practice on an intramural field. And when men's intramural started, we got kicked off. But I loved it and just decided that I wanted to do that for a career. I wanted to coach and I was a marine biology major. So I ended up going and getting my master's degree in physical education and sports psych at UNC Greensboro and started my coaching career in a weird way in that my first job was the head men's and women's swimming and diving coach at UNC Greensboro, a job for which I was not qualified Uh, but did that for two years. And then in the spring, it was just a fall sport at the time. In the spring, I was the assistant softball coach. And then was very fortunate in the uh, summer of 78, uh, 
the 70, yes, 78, uh, Florida State began to hire the coaches full time. So they began for women's teams. So I was asked to apply, did apply, and ended up getting the position and uh, coached for 30 years there. And just like Judy was very fortunate, got to do what I loved as a career. So as they say, I never worked a day in my life. Um, but uh, same thing, a lot of battles during that time. Uh, we've come a long way, but there is a long, long way to go. You know, I was thinking, I was thinking as I didn't talk about my playing career, but just prior to coming to Santa Barbara, I had played on the Canadian national team and we had just been in Japan uh, for the world championship. That says how old I am, second world championship or first, I guess, in 1970. Uh, but we played in front of 30,000 people in Japan. And so I get to Santa Barbara and as I said, I was proud. I had a jacket, you know, that from the Canadian national team, I was proud to wear that. And here I came to a country that I thought was going to give me all these great opportunities. I'm told not to wear the jacket because I'll embarrass myself being recognized as an athlete. You know, it's interesting because Deb Palazzi told a story like that a couple of weeks ago. We did a conversation and that, you know, she had to choose whether she was going to be a cheerleader or a basketball player. And her whole heart said, I want to be a basketball player. But it was such a difficult choice because of the stigma that was attached of her leaving, you know, the cheerleading team to start this basketball team right at the time when schools were beginning to sponsor sports. And, and she talked a lot about that, you know, quite emotionally about how difficult it was to want to do something so much and then, you know, be ostracized for it. And so I think, you know, that is there's something there, you know, there's something there that is probably predates Title IX and, and even you know, being able to have equal opportunities that you know really didn't present themselves as equal for quite some time. Is that is that accurate, Judy? Yeah, and I did my thesis then on attitudes toward women softball players. I couldn't understand why uh, why I had to hide that I was a softball player. So uh, anyway, it's yeah, it's it was a sad struggle. I, I used to have my clinics print a little poster that I got out of one of the women's sports magazines. It shows this little girl in a ballerina outfit on her tiptoes. And she's about six years old. And she said, all I ever wanted to be was a shortstop. Mm -hmm. I love it. Well, and it's amazing now to see television in so many places celebrate athleticism and yeah. celebrate, you know, women who are, are strong and they're leaders and they're doing so many things. And um, you both started, I think at the same time, at, you know, Judy, you had been at Golden West and won four national championships, I believe. And please correct me if I'm wrong um, at, at Golden West. And then, but it, both of you, I think it was that, that 79 range where you started at Fullerton and, and Florida state. What do you remember first or most about the early years and, and maybe things that you felt like there were some discrepancies in where your teams were compared to teams in the rest of the department. Coach Graff, you want to start with that one? Oh, sure. <laughs> I'd say there was a lot of discrepancies and I think that was really uh, frustrating in a way, but it, it also, you kind of understood where you were, but you weren't happy with it at all. Because like I said, when, we, when I first started coaching there, again, we were on intramural fields right behind the baseball field, which had, you know, outfield fence, bleachers, scoreboard, dugouts, you know, and we had benches and a guy in a, that brought a cooler to sell concessions. And we had no fences and people would walk through the outfield. And, you know, I had a grad assistant so, a coach who would, was the basketball assistant. So I didn't get her till after basketball was over. You know, the kids, of course, bought their own gloves, their own bats. You didn't have sponsorships or any of that. And yet the men's teams did. So it was, it was very, very frustrating. And I think that um, kind of created the fact that we were so close in, in sight of the baseball field kind of created that. Why don't we have that? Like, you know, why is it, why aren't the women getting that same opportunity? And I think that really formed my whole attitude of we need to fight for these things, you know, kind of thing. So the discrepancies just kind of go on and on and uh, long, long battles. And I'm sure we'll talk about it kind of throughout the way, but that's kind of how I started getting my feeling about equality in Title IX was kind of right at the beginning. 
Judy, for you, what were your initial thoughts? Well, I, I was at Westmont College two years before I went to Golden West College, and I was hired to be a coach there. But when I asked about uniforms, they, I was told, this was in, what, 69, you don't need uniforms. I said, yes, we do. What are we going to play in? So they gave us the men's leftover basketball uniforms from the year before. Uh, and I said, that's unacceptable, and they couldn't understand why. Um, one of the lessons, one time I was sitting at the dining room table of the athletic director at Bakersfield College. I was on, um, I was at Fullerton at that point, and we were still driving vans to all of our games. You know, the coach would you'd coach a doubleheader, and then you had, as tired as you were, you had to drive home. And we're sitting there talking about how tired we get are as coaches. And the husband of the AD came in and was listening to this. And then he said, and I'll never forget, when is a girl's life going to be as important as a boy's life? You're risking their life every time you drive that van. And I went, wow, you are right. And I went home back to the AD and I said, I refuse to drive a van anymore. We have to have buses. Our athletes' lives are as important as the male counterparts. Laundry, uh, I was complaining one time to the equipment manager how tough it is to be on the road, play the doubleheaders, and at midnight go find a laundromat that's open and safe, and how I take my two, at least two other people because we're scared to death as women to be at a laundromat at one o'clock in the morning. He said, you do your own laundry? He said, yes. He said, I said, well, what do the baseball teams do? He said, the other team does it for them. You just turn it in after the games. So he said, let me call Utah State. So he called Utah State and said, when your game's over, take the laundry. They're going to do it. And I re remember Lloydine Searle looking after the game. We were packing our stuff up into the bag. She said, what are you doing? I said, I'm taking it to your equipment room so they'll do our laundry. She goes, they don't even do our laundry. How did you get this? Yeah. But the, uh, they said, well, nobody ever asked and nobody ever told us what a big problem that was. But from sleeping four people, you know, we shared bedrooms, four people to a bed. Uh, and the girls lots of times weren't comfortable. So many of them slept on the floor. Two would sleep on the floor. They flip a coin to see who got the beds and who had to sleep on the floor. Uh, we shared that. We had sack lunches. We drove vans. We did our own laundry. We did it. We had to do it all because uh, otherwise... It just didn't get done. Yeah, I tell you, Judy, that reminds me. We had to have a student drive the other van because, like I said, I didn't have an assistant coach right away. So I would drive one van, and a student athlete actually drove the other van. And I tell you, I thank God. I think now about all the liability concerns, and I think nobody back then even gave it a second thought. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a concern, you know, for most of the administrators. One, we had a lawyer, I think, at one time come in and talk to us about that. And he said, just make sure to cover your tail. You got to stop every two hours and have coffee and make everybody get out. And we had student drivers, too, at times. Mm -hmm. And take a break every two hours. At least that will, the lawsuits won't be quite as big. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, I was in, I graduated from college in 2002. And my my sophomore year, no, my freshman year, we drove ourselves to spring break in Florida from Kentucky um, mm -hmm. in our, our parents' minivans. I mean, we had like four or five of us that had parents that, and we, we drove ourselves. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that wasn't, I mean, not, you know, it wasn't that long ago. So I like to think it wasn't, the more I do the math, the more I realize it was, um, you know, but you're, you're still 30 years after Title IX. I mean, mm -hmm. baseball wasn't driving themselves in vans in 2002. So, and, yeah. and so I know we're 30 years after small NAI school, but still, again, it's right. The, the life of a, of a human or whatever that might be. But um, when did, when did you notice maybe the responses started to change? Cause Judy, surely it wasn't as easy as I'm not driving a van anymore. Voila, here's buses and I'm not doing laundry. Voila, here's, here's laundry service. Well, what were re responses typically when you said, I don't like this? You didn't get very far. It just, that's the way it is. Um, and uh, until at Cal State Fullerton, we threatened a lawsuit, then, then our budgets got increased dramatically. 
uh, president was on the Title IX NCAA committee, and here we were being discriminated against. And we said, this isn't going to look good for you. And uh, within two weeks, we had a couple hundred thousand more. Uh, but it, it just, it still just didn't happen. Um, we did a, they were doing a huge um, improvement to facilities at Fullerton. Um, and it was, I, I forget how many millions, of, well, they built a football soccer stadium. So it was millions and it, they were improving the baseball field. And they said, we'll improve your, your uh, softball field too. And when I looked at what the budget was, is one one thousandth of one percent. They gave us fourteen thousand dollars out of a million dollars, millions of dollars budget. Fourteen thousand. Uh, we had a big fight over. There was forty thousand. Another forty thousand. They said, "Well, we could maybe give that to you, but we'll have to have a meeting." They had a meeting, and then they decided no, they were going to put removable windows in the press box at the football stadium, knowing we were dropping football the next year. But they said, no, foot, uh, softball doesn't get the 40,000. Uh, we're going to remove these windows, even though the football coaches said, and press people said, we don't want the removal. We don't want that. We, we have air conditioning. Why do we want removable windows? Anyway, so they gave me 14,000 of millions and millions. And we're talking about this is in, uh, I mean, the late 80s, uh, early 90s. And then we were uh, having a press ribbon cutting and we were all supposed to be up there with shovels and I refused to go. I said, I'm not going to be, I'm going to the press telling them what we aren't getting. And then they sat me down and said, be a team player. You can't go to the press. So I was threatened with that, but I didn't show up for the groundbreaking. So I got 14,000 and they said, we'll put some new bleacher, metal bleachers behind third base. That was my, how they were upgrading the softball stadium. The bill came in for $16,500. I came back and said, can we order them now? I need an extra 2,500. And they said, nope, we don't have it in the million dollars of budget that we're using on this mm -hmm. new soccer stadium, football. And so I pulled out my checkbook and wrote a check for 2,500 said, here, order. And that's how we got the bleachers. I'm still mad. <laughs> what would you do? I'd be sending an, in an invoice. You send an invoice over there. Oh, yeah. But, but Jenny... Oh, go ahead, Joanne. Oh, I was going to say the way we got our equipment shed at our second field, because by this time we'd moved off the intramural fields, but we had no equipment shed. So we had to haul all the equipment over to the facility in the trunk of my car. And so one of my players was lifting out that blue jugs machine. I know Judy will remember those <laughs> blue jugs machine out of my the trunk of my car and she hurt her back. So we reported it and um, the university uh, insurance person said, well, what can be done to prevent this from happening again? Simply said, well, we need a place to store our equipment. We had that like that. So it was kind of the university doing it, not really the athletic department taking care of that part. Um, and, and I think one thing that helped at Florida State was we, at one point got a Title IX committee on campus. And one time I had, we had driven buses to North Carolina to play. And then we came back and I got called in the AD's office and they said, well, why did you drive a bus? And I went, because that's, I'm staying within my budget and that's what we can afford. And they said, well, you're to no longer do that. If you go to North Carolina, you need to fly. Well, then I found out the very following week, the baseball team had flown up there and somebody had said something uh, because of course they weren't gonna increase our budget. So it was outside forces really kind of helped in that area a little bit. We got the bathroom at the softball field. Uh, we had two softball fields and no bathroom, not even porta potties, you had to walk quite a distance to the gym to go to the bathroom. Even I remember the doing that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and so we talk about, we had to go outside the athletic department. Uh, so my daughter was six or seven at the time. And, and she, she said, I'm scared when I have to go to the bathroom, walking in the dark over to the gym to go to the bathroom during the double headers. I said, why don't you write to the college president? So she did, she hadn't wrote a little note to the college president how scared she was to walk in the dark during her mom's softball games. And we got a bathroom then uh, within the year. 
but it was going above the athletic departments. Athletic departments, it's mm-hmm. always, we don't have the money. Um, I, uh, I, one of the things I've learned and, and going to the coaches convention this year, and I hope we talk about this a little bit more about not settling for less, but we as women have not understood mm-hmm. what to fight for. And even, I mean, we don't know what to fight for. We find out secondhand many times. Mm-hmm. Um, after I won the national championships, I thought this is a good time to go in and ask for a raise. Okay, so on the way home, I asked the, uh, uh, my AD, uh, you think I, I'm on a 10 month contract, baseball's on 12 months. Um, and yet you keep calling me all summer to come in on my time off to be on committees, to do this, to do that. And, and he's getting paid for it and I'm not. And so they said, yeah, we'll, we'll put you on 12 months, just like the baseball. Well, I didn't know they were just going to divide my salary by 12 now instead of 10. I assumed I was going to get more money. So now I was at 12 months, getting less Mm -hmm. per month, and it just was spread out over 12 months. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they said, well, we put you at the bottom of the next scale. Look how much you can improve. In the next 20 years, you can improve every year, go up the steps. I said, I want to be up at the top right now. Uh, Mm -hmm. But I didn't get it but uh, I didn't know what to ask yeah. for. I wasn't smart enough to go in with a lawyer uh, or somebody to help me with the contracts. Yeah, I really think you have to, the coaches need to educate themselves because one of the things I found out is they, I agree with Judy, they won't ever tell you what baseball is getting, who is, who I consider our counterpart. Um, and so one time we, when they very first started giving courtesy cars to coaches, Um, I was like next in line and was told, oh, they had discontinued that program. They weren't doing that anymore. Within two weeks of the men's swim coach getting getting hired, the new one, he had a car. So I had to file a grievance with the university, but I had to go in and document everything that the baseball assistants and head coaches were getting. And then our head coach, well, me as a head coach and my assistants, and, um, you know, the committee, and it was black and white facts, figures, no emotion, and ended up winning that grievance. And so I got a car, my assistants got raises, I got a little bit of a raise. One other time, one of the, assi- you know, when the baseball assistants started getting courtesy cars, I asked for my assistants, was told that the baseball assistant's car was his wife's car, that his wife worked for the car company. So I called the car company. They'd never heard of the wife, you know, and so it was it's very, very frustrating. And then I think to Judy's uh, comment one year after we'd won the World Series, we'd won the ACC tournament. Of course, all our players graduated. Um, Our baseball coach had just gotten a big raise because Georgia was looking at him. And so I went in and asked for a raise and in a meeting with the athletic director and the senior women's administrator and and said, do I need to go look for a, you know, a job at a different university to get a counter offer? And the senior women's administrator looked at me very seriously and said, you can do that, but we may not counter offer. So it was very much of a threat, which I found And of course, we only had one year contracts. I had for 30 years, a one year contract every year. And it was kind of a way to keep their thumb on you, you know, a little bit, but it was, it was that threatening, you know, the men will get raises if they get looked at by somebody else, but the women won't. So uh, hopefully that's changing a little bit with multi-year contracts and a lot more knowledge. And one of the things I think, and I'll, I'll say this about, Judy and Sharon Backus and a lot of women before me even, women were very good about sharing salaries and benefit information with other coaches. And I think that was crucial in finding out, okay, Florida State's not paying as well as schools on the West Coast or the Midwest or, you know, and so it really helped a little bit to be able to, again, facts and figures document that other coaches are making this and they're getting like the men were getting graduation bonuses. They were getting bonuses for winning conference championships, regional championships, going to the world series. We weren't getting any of that, you know, until we started saying, well, Hey, wait a minute, how come this is happening here? 
but not over here. And then everybody's like, oh, how do you know that? So you got you to gotta do your homework. I learned to do my homework when Joanne sent me to the library to um, copy, copy the Acosta Carpenter report and the, um, you know, finance, whatever from, from Florida State University books, like my second day um, as a graduate <laughs> assistant at Florida State. And I still use those, those things today because sometimes you can't ask, like, that's the other part, Coach Graf, you know, if, if you try to ask the, the baseball coach, um, then all of a sudden baseball coach says something, athletic director, athletic director comes mm -hmm. back to you and, you know, it's, it's ugly. And so it's, it's sad how sneaky sometimes you have to be mm -hmm. to try to figure those things out. I've learned so much from just picking up stuff off the copier before, like I was at central Michigan, somebody left a plan for an indoor hitting facility for baseball on mm -hmm. the conceptual mm -hmm. drawings, architect layout budget. They left it on the copier. I just happened to be the next one there to get it. Well, I thought Margot was going to lose her mind. Um, mm -hmm. cause no one had heard anything about this yet. And so yeah. It just, yeah, it is nuts. But Judy, what were you going to say? Well, we're uh, right now, one of the, one of the good things about being retired is they can't, as one of the other coaches said, they can't fire us anymore. And uh, the AD, I'm starting to know him better at Fullerton. And we've had some nice honors lately. And we were just put in the hall of fame, the team was and so forth. And, mm -hmm. and I've spent a little more time with them. And I said to him the last ball game I was sitting at him, with I said hey Jim you know I'm coming at you and he said I know I'm getting ready <laughs> and uh so we're having a fight at Fullerton right now on salaries the new baseball coach just was hired no money in the budget right he gets a yeah. hundred hundred thousand dollars more than Kelly who has been uh very successful at mm -hmm. Fullerton and when she asked about um uh, uh raises her assistants get half of what the baseball does uh, she first of all went in and asked that they just at least get part, another half of what the mm -hmm. baseball does. And then we all went to the coaches convention and heard the message, don't settle for less, you know, ask for what you deserve. And so she went back and, and with my prodding too, asked for the same amount as the baseball coaches, uh, for her assistance. And she's fighting now to get her salary up to where the baseball people are. Now, you want to hear some lame arguments? Here's the ones that came out of the AD's office. They coach nine innings. You only get to coach seven. They work harder than you do. Mm -hmm. I said, go back and tell them you play double headers. 14 is bigger, more than nine. Figure out the math. Yeah. They also have more players to take care of than you do. Well, they also have more coaches to take care of those players than you do. Those were two of the reasons she was told that she doesn't deserve as much money. Uh, in the state of California, at least budget uh, salaries are have to be printed. So it, with some work, you can find out what everybody is getting. One of the schools in the big conference and, I, and I, the big West conference is have the press just um, mm -hmm. actually, if you want to look at uh, it's at San, Cal Poly San Luis, the press there has been on it and they've just published all the salaries of base of, of all the men's coaches versus the women's coaches. Yeah. Um, and so there's a movement to try to equalize it. Um, I, I, I was struck by one of the comments with the soccer people, athletes finally getting the settlement from, you know, FIFA and so forth. Uh, one of the soccer play, women soccer players said for me, so many years, I asked myself, why, why was I so unlucky to be born a female? And I thought, isn't that sad that we, mm -hmm. you know, that's, here was a, one of the top soccer players in the world. She said, now, she said, now as I look back, I'm proud of the journey. Yeah. But uh, it's just um, the reason I got treated well at Golden West College is the AD, a pro football coach, had six daughters. Mm -hmm. He took his daughter out to the softball field to sign up and found out they had no uniforms. And they were playing on a bumpy field with, gra with uh, glass and stuff all over. And he said, we're going to make a difference. And he came in and hired me to come in and turn the softball program around at, at Golden West College. But uh, yeah, uh, it, it's so fresh. Let me tell you also what just happened this weekend. And uh, the AD hasn't responded to my text. I told him I was coming after him. I have his cell phone number now. Uh, the Judy Garman Classic was just at 
Fullerton and it was freezing. We had that cold spell come through. We were freezing Thursday night, sitting at the games, go up to the concession stand, no hot drinks, no hot mm -hmm. coffee, no hot chocolate. I said, why? They said, we don't have equipment to have hot drinks out here. We said, well, when are you going to get equipment? He said, well, if you come back tomorrow, there's a baseball game and you can walk over to the baseball concessions and get it. I said, so you have hot coffee for baseball games mm -hmm. going on at the same time as softball. We have to walk over to their field to get it. He said, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I texted the AD right away and said, you know, what's going on to tell me, wait for baseball games and then you can have hot coffee. It's just not right in this day and age. No, it's not. And how expensive is it to have a coffee pot, you know, or a hot water to make hot chocolate? It's not that expensive. And I think the excuses are what kind of get tiring a little bit. You know, it's always an excuse. Um, you know, we couldn't put uh, advertisement out on the outfield wall because, quote, we would have only made $40,000. We couldn't sell tickets because, you know, it would cost more to man the, the ticket booth and people would pay tickets. So this year, Florida State sold out all their reserve seat tickets. You know, so now they're beginning to talk about adding more seats, you know, but four years ago, um, the president of the university stood up when FSU won the national championship and he said, we're going to get you all a new scoreboard because the scoreboard wasn't working. They still don't have a new scoreboard in 2022 and yet baseball has a huge video board. I mean, it's like, yeah, I can't even tell you how big this thing is. So it's you know, it's just really amazing sometimes um, what you have to, it's like you got to continue to to ask for things and, and expect it and fight for it instead of somebody coming and saying, you know, hey, you guys deserve this. We're going to do this right now. You know, I mean, simple things. But to go back a little bit to Judy's point about salaries being public record, they are, and coaches, though, need to realize a lot of the, at FSU, they run a lot of things through the booster office. So sometimes that's not considered part of state salaries or state benefits. So you really have to know, you know, does your coach get a life insurance policy? Do they get a retention bonus? Do they get a graduation bonus? You know, do they get all these kind of things? And so uh, you have to, yes, know the base salary, which is good for retirement benefits, but you also got to know these extra things. You know, how many courtesy cars do they get if you're at a big school or now, a lot of them are doing car allowances. That's what I think they're doing at Florida State. But who's getting the car allowances? You know, so uh, you really have to keep at that. It is crazy. We we talked about this a little bit on the the last call. An SEC coach um, who's been to you know a bunch of World Series and um, has not won a championship, but has been to several. You know. Um, is making 35% of the newly hired baseball coaches salary, uh -huh. um, you know, and it's, it's not even, it's not even close. And, and so much of that, you're right. Coach Graf is, is hidden. And so when you talk to, you know, our NFCA attorney, Samantha Ekstrand, it's until you have the contracts, the actual physical contract, you don't know who's getting a radio bonus. So, you know, softball coach does a, is supposed to do a radio show once a week, but it's just part of the expectations and baseball coach gets $50,000 for doing the radio show. They're doing the same show. This, the baseball coach is getting paid for it, but that's not a coaching salary. That's extra. That's just because of extra duty. Um, and it's, it's nuts, but it's a, a good example, even, even at Florida state and Fullerton, you're both excellent examples of, you know, I, Last time I looked, I think Mike Martin Jr. in baseball was over four hundred thousand dollars, and um, okay. you know Coach Alameda's, I think in the, in the twos, and uh, you know it's well, and he'd never yeah. been a head coach. Yeah, That's he right. had never been a head coach before. So, yeah, and, um, yeah it's it really is it very frustrating. Yeah. You know, I, I used to teach a class which I allowed as Intro to Physical Education when I was at Golden West, and I would write on the blackboard. Uh, Team A and Team B, and I would write Team A and, you know, vans, sack lunches, all the things we're talking about, do your own laundry, one set of uniforms, put all that stuff down. And then I would put Team B, and I would put all of the things that we're talking about that men traditionally get. And, and usually the class was about 
80% guys and 20% women, girls and women. So then I'd say, okay, I want to vote now. How many people want to coach team A? Who mm -hmm. had nothing? Nobody, of course. Mm -hmm. Who wants to coach team B? Everybody wanted to do that. I said, okay, uh, do you think it's fair between A and B? Eh, well, who knows? Who, you know, is ambivalent. Then I changed the titles. Team A, blacks only. Team B, whites only. And I said, okay, what do you think now? That's illegal. That's wrong. That's not fair. The stuff mm -hmm. that came out, of, especially of all the male athletes that were in this class, that's discriminatory. You can't do that. And after they would get really riled up and there would always be some black athletes in it too, the class too. Then I changed the titles again, women, men. Well, what do you mm -hmm. think now? And then all of a sudden the rhetoric calmed down, you know, and quiet. Well, and then all the excuses started as to why, but they could see the unfairness when you put different labels mm -hmm. on, but they have such blinders when it comes to mm -hmm. discriminatory actions against women, which is illegal now in the educational institutions yeah. and in culture even so. And it's just, it's it, illegal, it, but it still goes on, yeah, yeah. you know, now still. one of the, one of the things I did one year, uh, because as Judy was talking about, they always try to make excuses. So our athletic director at the time would always say baseball is not considered the same sport as softball. So I went actually to the EEOC office in Atlanta, Georgia. And I had a whole bunch of questions about salary equity, you know, all extra benefits, all those things. And I flat out asked the person that I was talking to, I said, okay, so this is what our athletic director keeps telling me. And they shook their head and they say that is absolutely incorrect. And according to the law, it doesn't even have to be the same sport. It just has to be comparable. And she said, baseball and softball are as closely aligned as they can be. So she said they are definitely in the minds of the EEOC considered the same sport. So I always, you know, I know some other athletic directors are still using that reasoning now, you know, for their coaches, but it is totally not true. They go, you coach the same, you recruit the same, you have the same number of games, same type of season, use the same equipment. So uh, I thought that was interesting that the ADs will try to do whatever they can to kind of tamp you down and kind of pulled you back a little bit. At the end, Joanne, I'm sure you're both of Joanne are aware now that NCAA external gender equity review, phase mm -hmm. one of the basketball championships that came out August 2nd of 21, says baseball and softball are equal. Yeah. So, yeah, now we'll see if that actually ever gets implemented at the college level because. You know, again, they're talking about doing millions of dollars worth of renovation to our baseball field, and yet we're not hearing anything about the softball facility. So uh, there's still that just, you know, we got to do, we got to upgrade the men's facility for recruiting, but hey, women, you're doing okay. We don't need to upgrade your facility. And it's like, no, you need to do both at the same time. There's a great story a couple of days ago, Coach Graf, that I saw, and it was um, a little bit of an expose, not not really extremely hard written, but about the the success of of soccer and softball at Florida mm -hmm. State, how they're sharing a general area, how they need expanded seating in both locations, how um, you know they there's so much they need to do, and and yet the focus is still on the standalone football building. Oh yeah, uh, you know the millions and millions and millions, and um, it just it's really interesting because it just draws the success of softball and soccer on the women's side and how you can do so much for both of them at the same time because of their geographic yeah. proximity. And, um, and you talk to coach Alameda and, and all she's asking for is, is dipping dots. Yeah. You know, the fans, the fans want dipping dots and baseball has dipping dots and softball doesn't. And so she says, you know, not, I know, not but you know, football. again, to Judy's thing, they're going to, they're going to raise a hundred million dollars for this standalone football facility. Now they already have offices, weight room, train, you know, all that, but they want a standalone facility out of that hundred million, the women are going to get 5 million. That's today, days, day and time. You have that old book from, I got one from years ago. It said the stronger women get, the more men love their football. 
Mm-hmm. Well, and I, I think it's going to be interesting. I guess this is more in what's happen, going to happen in the future. I don't know if we're ready to jump to that, but the football staffs at Power Five schools have gone nuts. I mean, if you look at Alabama's football staff, their support staff is out of this world. Georgia is the same way. Florida is getting the same way. We are now getting the same way. And there's no way it's comparable on the women's side. There's just no way. So I'm anxious to see how long it takes somebody, you know, to, to say, wait a minute, you know, the women don't have all of these made up positions, these what do we have? A director of quality control for football. Now, what the heck? <laughs> you know? But we don't have that for softball or volleyball or women's tennis or women's swimming. So it, it just continues. I like to say the gap was like this and then the women came up a little bit, but the men went up. You know, so the gap is still, I think, the same or greater. greater. Although the women have gone up and we are in nicer facilities. We do have full-time coaches with good salaries and things like that. But is it equal? I would say not. No, I, okay. I agree. Yep. And, you know, so many of, of those things, and I just, I pulled it up. Yeah. Player development assistant, um, you know, assistant recruiting coordinators, assistant uh -huh. director of football operations and recruiting. Well, to be an assistant director, you got to have a director, uh -huh. you know? And so oh, yeah, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's definitely interesting. And, and if you remember, we tried to get a fourth accountable coach a couple of years mm -hmm. ago and it was no, it cost too much money. When the rule was being passed is it didn't even have to be a paid position. Like it could still be yeah. a volunteer assistant, but they would be able to do more things. They'd be able to coach the athletes back to the student athlete experience. You know, mm -hmm. you'd have another coach for them. You'd have, um, and it, it was shot down, you know, almost immediately. Yet I know that the coaches that are, are doing these things for football are, you know, making a minimum of $80,000. Uh -oh, minimum. Probably, yeah, fresh, minimum. Fresh out of college. Minimum. And I think baseball's now asking for that fourth coach. So it'll be interesting to see mm -hmm. yep. what happens because they're asking for it. And women's squads have gotten bigger. They're, you know, 28 people. Yeah. And, you know, you guys were both just so successful. And and I remember you telling me once, once Coach Graf, um, you – you were tolerated because you won. Mm -hmm. You know, you felt like the administration tolerated you because of, of how much you won. And do, did you feel that either of you, that you were um, able to advocate for more because of your success or was it, was it wasn't going to, going to make a difference because it was, there were still certain things that you could you know, try to get for your programs and certain things that just was deaf ears constantly. Well, I definitely thought I could advocate more and push a little more now, whether I got it all, but um, usually you didn't get everything, but you get something. But I did feel a little bit, even though I was on a year to year contract, I did feel job secure somewhat, but I also went and got my PhD so I could teach if I ever got fired. Um, but no, I think success does give you a little bit of a cushion because it is hard, I think, to fire a successful coach. Um, you know, it doesn't look good in the community and usually the community is a little more behind you. But anytime you do push, you have to realize you that could be a result is that they find a reason, you know, to get rid of you. But I think if you do a good job and you're solid and you have reasoning and facts and things like that, you can, you can push a little more, but I do think success helped me at least. I'm, um, I'm not, I think they weren't sure what to do with me. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Uh, I arrived there and the very first year we go to the college world series. So I think they thought there was going to be this growing period and, you know, we'll see what happens. And I had a women's athletic director too, which, you know, was separate from the men's who was a pusher, Leanne Grutke. So I had an advocate who was always on my side supporting. Um, but uh, we, Cassie Fullerton also didn't, we were known as a school with no budget and great dreams. And we were very successful, our baseball program, everything on very, very small budgets. Uh, but I just went out and found a way to get it done. And so they couldn't deny 
our, the football coach, he had a saying and he taught me well too. We had a good relationship with all the coaches because we're all scrambling for everything all the time. Uh, and he just said, you do it first and ask for forgiveness second. And, you know, just do what you need to do. And so I just did what I needed to do over and over again. So uh, uh, looking back, I think I raised over a million dollars to keep our program going. Uh, mm -hmm. And at that time, we didn't, the corporate sponsorships weren't part of, of the scene in softball and very little in baseball, as a matter of fact. In fact, when I went to Pony and got a contract with them, um, I said, Would, why don't you consider baseball too? So I got them Pony baseball uniforms. They didn't have a contract with anybody. I got the first contract with Easton and then we shared it with baseball. Uh, so I went out and got contracts that kept our program going. And, uh, but it was interesting. I mean, Pony, I had a choice. Pony would give me $10,000 in my pocket for $20,000 worth of equipment. I took the $20,000 worth of equipment. The baseball coach took the 10,000 in his pocket. Mm -hmm. but we couldn't, I couldn't afford, I needed the uniforms. I needed yeah. the shoes. And then he complained all the time, jokingly, because he knew what had happened. He said, they got four times the uniforms that we do. I said, yeah, Augie, but you know why. Uh, mm -hmm. But, uh, and I just uh, kept doing things, a press box, appeared over the weekend. Every, where did this $20,000 press box come from? Oh, it just got built on the weekend. Uh, are you going to tear it down now? It just passed code. We made sure. And so they left it there. So we were doing those things over and over again. And I think they, like I said, didn't know what to do. And we were successful. We went to College World Series all first four or five years in a row. Uh, on no budget. And that was the story. How was Garmin doing it with no money and so forth, but we just got it done. So. Yeah. And I'll give Judy a little clap because she was way ahead of her time for marketing and promotions. And a lot of us kind of looked at Judy and go, wow, you're doing all this out at Fullerton. And you really kind of showed us the way to do promotions and marketing because you did it first, you know, and you were successful doing it. And you were raising the money, you were sponsoring, you know, the tournaments out there. And, you know, you had got teams from the East Coast to go out there and things like that. So, Judy, good job. Thank you. What's well, one thing Margie Wright talked about a little bit too earlier when we were speaking is, you know, the number of people that they got to come to games and, and the support and, you know, having just the, the following at, at Fresno and, and some of the things they were able to do and, and how much that, you know, helped her. But then, um, you know, to your point, Joanne, when it was, when they felt like they couldn't fire her, they just started firing everybody else and um, doing some things. And when they had their uh, Office of Civil Rights and Title IX things going on and, um, you know, it's, it's interesting because I think a lot of people don't realize how many ways um, jobs can become difficult. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, not oh, just, yeah. <laughs> it's not just about like getting, getting rid of you, but the things that, you know, the, um, I don't know, the retaliation piece, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, what advice would you have for coaches who feel like maybe they're being retaliated against a little bit? Um, you know, obviously it's illegal and there, there are reasons mm -hmm. you, you can't do that, but what advice would you give to coaches who they're trying to, to advocate, but it's, it's backfiring horribly. I tell you, I'll tell you, I don't mean to jump ahead of Judy. You got to document, 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 because that they tried, they've done that with me and they would say stuff that wasn't true. I would go figure out who they, you know, were saying said it. I would ask them, I would say, did you say this? And they go, of course not you know, and document things and then respond in writing when needed to, when you need to. Um, because again, ADs tend to not want to keep anything in writing. You know, they won't, they'll do a lot of things verbally, but they won't do it in writing. And I always documented everything. If I had a meeting with a senior women's administrator, I would try to remember what she said, or I, I would bring a witness, somebody with me. Um, because one time I got called in, I, the senior women's administrator handed me a note and said, I need you to come to this meeting and you can bring somebody if you want. And I thought, oh boy, here we go. So I went, well, it was all this stuff she was making up. None of it was true. And so 
the people that were there, I just questioned them and I said, well, aren't I supposed to report NCAA violations? And of course the compliance goes, guy goes, yes, you are. And I went, okay, so why am I getting in trouble for that? <laughs> you know, so you really have got to document to protect yourself, I think, um, you know, because, and if there's things that other people can say for you, if you feel uncomfortable, parents, if you've got parents, if something's not right, the, the parents can go talk to somebody about it. You know, that protects you a little bit. Um, so I think those things are all, you know, all important. And then being up front with them, if there's, you know, if a kid, especially nowadays, is unhappy about something, give the AD a forewarning document that you've let them know exactly what's going on. Uh, because then if the story from the student athlete comes out differently, you know, you've already kind of preempted that by saying, no, this is what happened. You know, and I've already notified you of that because there are ways they can try to make you either uncomfortable or subordinate and, you know, not continue trying to improve your program. Because when the women fuss to improve their program or ask for things, we're complaining or we're, I won't say bitching, but, you know, we're using, we're, they, they call us that. If the guys advocate for their program, they're trying to be the best in the country and they want to promote their program and push their athletes. So it's a whole different way that the female coaches are treated, I think, than the male coaches. And I think finding the advocates to work with you, uh, mm -hmm. parents especially, parents who, well, are in a position to take a stand and put some pressure on, or even just the complaints. I mean, our first big road trip at Fullerton was on a bus because one of the parents paid for it. You know, he said, my kid's not going to Arizona in a van. Uh, and so when the AD sees that and there's some pressure on, well, maybe the next time they better have a bus too, or we can't have parents raising money to pay for buses. Uh, we, uh, <laughs> We had raised money to go to uh, Sweden on a road trip uh, in the summer, and we had over fifty or fifty thousand dollars in a, a bank account on campus. And all of a sudden, one day, I get a phone call from them saying that I owed so much interest for keeping that bank account open since it has zero money in it. <laughs> and I went, "Where did my fifty thousand go?" And with a little research, we found uh, that the football program ran out of money and they needed it for their uh, program to print it the next week. So they took my 50,000, even though associated students required two signatures, one of which it had to be mine. So I called one of the parents who was a lawyer. I said, would you make a phone call for me? And he made a phone call and he said, that money needs to be back in there within 24 hours or I'm coming down there with a, my law firm. And it reappeared in 24 hours. But, uh, you know, having parents advocate and, and fans uh, making, the, making the calls, uh, that, that gets you off the hook some of the times. What's amazing, just listening, the, the threat, like, and you just process it of, it feels like there has to be a threat of a lawsuit or something so severe to move the needle at all. Like just simply the comparison of this is not okay. And, you know, we have a, doing a call with uh, Carol Hutchins next week. And, you know, one of the things I, I can't wait to ask her about is, um, you know, her ongoing Twitter feud with Delta, right? And, but the underlying mm -hmm. thing with it is other sports teams at Michigan don't have the problem because they're chartering. They're chartering everywhere. Right. They don't lose luggage. They're not delayed four hours. They don't miss some uh, layover. They, uh -huh. and so, but, you know, if Carol Hutchins in Michigan, can't get a charter flight, then, you know, what in the world, how, how do we get there? Do you really think it's a, it's a lawsuit thing every, every time, or is there another way? Judy, what, what you thinking? Uh, unfortunately, it's looking, you know, Joanne said it so well, the gap has gotten, we've gone up, but the gap's gotten bigger and bigger and it's lawsuit because mm -hmm. people just refuse to deal with what's required. What do you think, Judy, is it, is it lawsuit or bust? Yeah, I think that's where we're at. And that's why with, it, with the NFCA, and I'm encouraging, I'm getting, I'll be getting on the phone. We've got to get more of us old timers back to the coaches convention. Joanne, you're going to be there next Christmas? I mean, I don't know. You know, it depends on this whole COVID thing. I, you know, I'm feeling better about it, but I just wasn't comfortable yeah. going out to Vegas this year. Yeah, I can. Um, 
but we need to, you know, as retired coaches, get together and start getting some of these lawsuits going or whatever we need to do to, to fight the battles because we're in a position that we can do it. And, yeah. uh, and we're in a position, we're all angry. Like Ralph Weekly said, I'm really getting more angry now than ever. I mean, the more mm -hmm. we worked so hard to see us falling behind and we need to get on the platforms and, uh, well, there's so many, you know, when we talk about the future thing, what's, you know, when Joanna, you, when you called to ask about this, and, you know, you start thinking it's 50 years since Title IX's been passed, 50 years, and it's still there. I mean, what institution has ever had their federal funds withheld because they're not up complying with Title IX? You know, nobody. There's, like, no teeth behind it, and... I think one of the areas we've got to improve is, you know, getting more female administrators, you know, because a lot of the female administrators, I think, feel like they, they, they get intimidated by things that they can't, you know, bring up, you know, why are we not paying this person? Why are all the director of sports, like, one of the things that bugs me a little bit is like the director of tennis is a guy, the director of track is a guy, director of swimming is a guy, you know, so all the head head coaches of these combined sports all seem to be men, you know, and, and so I, I think if women can get more involved in administration, that like Judy was saying, you had a, a female athletic director who was had your back. Um, you know, when Barbara Palmer was mine, I felt like she had my back, but she was very early on. But then some later administrators, you didn't feel like they had your back, you know. And so I think they're, they're really, it's just a shame that an administrator can't take two programs and say, kind of like they did with women's basketball, the NCAA thing last year. Here's the weight room for the women and here's the weight room for the men. It, you can't switch them and be happy, you know, because that was one of the things somebody always taught me. If you can take the women's weight room at the NCAA and the women's I mean, men's weight room and you could switch them and both parties would be happy, they would be equitable because you hear the terms equal, equitable, comparable, you know, but it just doesn't seem like anybody's being forward about that. Like we're not, you know, we don't have people at our institutions willing to kind of put themselves on the line. You just reminded me, I wrote a letter last week or two weeks ago, and I have not gotten any response from anybody. That's interesting. I wrote it to Riverside Community College, uh, watching the local news, and here's the women's basketball coach coming on and complaining about their, they get access to the weight room once a week. And after <laughs> complaining, they got it twice a week now. Their, their practice time, but only three times a week, their practice times are cut short because the men's basketball program won't get off the floor when it's their time. Mm -hmm. And she went to the press finally. So I wrote to the college president and the AD and I haven't gotten any answer. And I wrote a letter complimenting her for having the guts to go to the press. And I wonder what's happening. I got to follow up to see. I what don't know. Put that on your to-do list. Yeah. You have to update us. You have to update us on that. I just think it's awesome that you know, you're taking taking the time to to do that. We talked about that a little earlier with some other calls too. Of you know, why was it that the you know the men's basketball team would always use the women's locker room for a visiting team, mm -hmm. right? But the women's visiting mm -hmm. teams, you know, where do they go? And you know, you you've got UCLA with maybe the greatest history of softball of of any anyone, and you look at their facility. And it's, uh -huh. I mean, it just, it's, it's past sad. I mean, it's, it should be infuriating and I know it is to so many, um, but the, the piece of, of comparison and, you know, locker room access and weight room access. And I mean, those should, those should be the things that are long gone 50 years later to your point, Joanne. I mean, how does that yeah. even exist 50 years later? And uh, where, where do you think is next? And Judy, you talked about getting, getting people together and, and the lawsuits and going, but to truly drive some equality, what do you think women's sports softball in general need to do? We need to get more press and we need to work with the press and people are just shocked when they hear a lot of, you know, just everybody was shocked about the women's basketball last uh -huh. year. And we just need more, more of that press and, and uh, writing letters. I mean, I, 
I find I just make time to write the letters. They were just putting a brand new complex in in Indio and beautiful baseball fields and all this. And so I wrote wrote to the to the pa local paper, you know, not, not just to the city council. Uh, where, where what's happening for the girls? Where's the softball field? Mm -hmm. What are you doing on that? Uh, but I think just bring it at forefront. In fact, I spent about four hours at the softball term, my softball tournament on Saturday. I ran into a man who wanted to start talking, and uh, uh, and he's a baseball fan, but he decided to come. And he said he gave just gave twenty five thousand to endow some softball. Uh, scholarships because he thinks baseball is getting a little bit too much, but he still was everything. Baseball put Fullerton on the map. Baseball did this, and I had kept trying to educate him. You know, it mm -hmm. only put it on the map because that's the only thing the press would talk about. You know, we helped put Fullerton on the map too, yeah. and we helped get a lot of these sponsors. But baseball got credit for it anyway. So I, I was, and by the time we were done, and we'll see. He and I are going to build a concession stand that has a coffee pot in it. And he <laughs> said, because we talked to the concession people, and I was up there raising such a ruckus, and they all still call me coach, but I, I talked yeah. to the head guy, bring the catering coffee pots over here. You know, plug them in. Carry the, where am I going to get the water? From the bathroom, for heaven's sakes. Or there's a hose here. Yeah. So I'm solving their problem. And they had coffee the next night. So when we announced it on the loudspeaker, coffee is now available. But only because I'm up there screaming. Even the facility person, uh -huh. the they Fullerton couldn't care less about it. Uh, but anyway, by the time we were done, <laughs> if you want to see a funny picture, you'll see me serving coffee to people in the stands because the guy went out to Starbucks and brought this big box of coffee back, which I could drink. So I went up and started pouring it, <laughs> delivering it to the fans. And one of the guys said, I'm getting coffee served by the name, you know, the legend that this tournament is named after. And I'm pouring coffee and Deb Hartwick had a ball with putting that on Facebook. But I anyway, was going to say you should for, be doing selfies and taking yeah. pictures. And, well, I did. And um, yeah. so anyway, by the time we we're done, he said, I've got some contacts. I think I can bring a trailer in here. We're going to remodel it. He said, give me one week. So we're going to see. And I said, I'll help raise money for. And then he said, we'll open it to the base. You have windows for both baseball and softball. I said, uh-uh, softball only. They can walk to this side unless baseball helps raise money to pay for their half of mm -hmm. it. Not and he said, oh, okay. But I finally, but four hours later, I came down and said, I need a drink. I'm exhausted working. This <laughs> but I think we might have it. So get, get something done. But that's the only way we'll get. The can, baseball has a nice concession area, which they share with soccer. Yeah. It was built that way, but we have a temporary tables up there. And I mean, it's. Yeah. So, Joanne, I'll ask you a question. Have you um, seen, have they done a comparison of between the Men's College World Series and the Women's College World Series? I haven't seen a report. Yes, $10 million, that. right, $10 Joanne? Million. $10 million yeah. difference. $10, $10 million okay. difference. It's on our it's on our website, Joanne. I'll send it to you too. But okay. Uh, $10 million difference. And um, but you know what what kills me? And there's so many things to unpack here. And but I've been to both. I've had the opportunity to to be at both. And there are things that are unique to the setting geographically in Omaha that Oklahoma City doesn't have. I mean, you guys have both been to Oklahoma City. Yeah. You know, to to shut down the streets and have a parade there, you can't. But you can't even walk safely as a pedestrian from the overflow parking. Mm -hmm. So you got to be able to, you know, have something of of those two. But it looks like they're doing away with a lot of the men's celebratory events. So the concert, the seventy five ticket dinners where softball had a, you know. A, 25. Mm -hmm. I don't remember what the number of tickets allotted were. Um, you know, post game celebration on the field, it was eight armbands for softball and it was 70 something for baseball for friends and family to celebrate on the field. I mean, there were wow. things that you could just tell person A and person B had never mm -hmm. talked. They yeah. never talked. And when we when we did our portion for the Kaplan Hecker group, it was um, I took it all from the pre champs manual. I mean, it's all mm -hmm. written. It's all written there in, in black and white. I just made a table and, yeah. you know, it's, so it's really, it's a struggle. Um, and you know, they're going to do a lot of different things. I, I think to your COVID point earlier, coach graph, I think that's going to allow them to kind of 
back out of a lot of it. Um, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. instead of doing a banquet, we're just doing private dinners for each of the eight teams, baseball and softball, no big banquet. And I think it helps the NCAA bottom line budgetarily. Yeah. I think it helps. I'm not saying it's the wrong decision. Just it's maybe a workaround, you know, we'll be interested mm -hmm. to see. But a lot of it's TV money and there's a lot of things. What did you think, Coach Garman? Well, one of the, I want to share with you too, I just met a lady uh, at the tournament who's a professor at Cal State Fullerton, and she's doing a documentary right now for ESPN, and it's on discrepancy in between baseball and softball at Cal State Fullerton, mm. and she's been filming and documenting things now for the last year, and she's following five softball players and five baseball players. Oh, and wow. They're treated differently, uh, and so it's going to be interesting. In fact, I told her I'm starting to go through files and throwing old newspapers stuff out and whatever. I said, you know, I've got all these clippings from forever. And uh, she said, don't throw anything out. She said, I'll drive out to the desert. I want everything that the press has ever written about baseball oh. or softball here at Fullerton. And they're doing a documentary. So it'll be interesting to see how that comes out. But she's doing that in the next mm -hmm. right now. She had a uh, cameramen out there doing the tournament filming different things so yeah well one of the nice things about social media is that now there's so much stuff out there that you know you can see what is going on you know more than you ever could when we were coaching I think and I took pictures for her Friday night baseball with the coffee and the VIP area <laughs> and they had a barbecue going for their VIPs couple hundred people in the stands and the softball because we back up to it UCLA was playing we had thousand and some I don't know 1500 people there and they had coffee and mm -hmm. we did it you know so anyway but she'll have all those pictures to show too and uh, all the food venues. and what's sad is that's the only that's the one thing you wanted and how easy and inexpensive is it to do that you know <laughs> crazy that's the kicker well and i remember you know coach graf in the in the early 2000s just the the struggle for covered batting cages uh -huh. right and so you know it was you know baseball has them you don't and i it was uh but you're you can use them you can use them when it rains yeah. i remember i remember going over there you know and walking buster in the posey, rain yeah yep. buster posey was in there hitting and and I, he he must have been warned about you because he ran i mean he he <laughs> saw the softball coming and he ran and but you know now you look in the, in the the double decker and the you know so much of the of the great stuff but why why did it why did it take so long and, and some of that's still individual mm -hmm. fundraising i know coach alameda had to do a lot and you as well with yeah. some of those things well and it was interesting going back to the back so we asked them to put the covered hitting cages between both fields because they're back to back they're right together no they weren't going to get covered hitting cages what i was told they weren't getting i said it's on every plan it's on every newspaper <laughs> article no, baseball's not getting it. Well, they put it way over on the, the first base side. It's far away from softball. Like I think they thought we weren't going to see it, you know? <laughs> and so luckily now they do have a covered hitting facility so the kids don't have to walk in the rain like we did to go over there. It was, again, it's just nuts. A bad decision, you know, by administrators. I think part of the administrator thing too is you talked about the having more women involved, but it's become such a, a tokenism piece in mm -hmm. administrators. And I don't think that was ever, well, maybe it was now that I learn more, but um, the whole idea of an SWA, you know, it was, it was supposed to be a voice at the table, but it became a reason to only have one, mm -hmm. it seems. And so then, then you're left with one. Well, if I, if I advocate for and help bring more people into the ranks when there's only one job, I'm putting myself out of a job. So it became this very siloed, protect yeah. yourself at all cost kinds of positions. And sometimes I wonder if the separate athletic departments, you know, that with Iowa and Tennessee and some places you hear about before you talked about it, Coach Garmin, if, if there aren't some really good things there that we should be re-examining on how to make athletic departments function, function at, a, at a higher level. One of the things, and this is a different topic, but you're editing, I know, uh, came out, I can't share with you who told me this, 
but at one of the schools where they're doing a salary fight right now, uh, it came back by a, a friend who was at the meeting where the salary for a basketball coach, women basketball coach is being discussed and why she wasn't paid equal to the men's. And the answer came back, well, she's not complaining enough. So let's just ignore it for a while. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm sad I'm not surprised. You know, I think that's the that's the hardest piece. Uh, well, I know I've taken a big chunk of both your all's day, but is there anything you think we've missed? Is there anything that, you know, in, in the direction of the conversation, you think that uh, people really need to think about? And, and then a, a second question, you can do either or both. When you think about young athletes today, and they're not familiar with Title IX, they don't know what it is or where it came from, coaches as well. What do you think are the most important lessons for the next generation of, of advocates to know and understand? A any way you want to go with those questions, you y'all should feel free. Coach Garman, think, oh, Coach Garman go ahead. I'm sorry. I think it's important for coaches to educate. Uh, and, you know, as we're seeing in the politics and we're seeing in the struggles in the, around the world right now, if we don't understand history, we can't take care of the future. Uh, and I think it's uh, at the tournament, uh, Joanne, uh, Joe Evans had me come and talk to the A&M team. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I shared with the special relationship we had with A&M over all the years. And uh, so it gave some history, which they enjoyed hearing and, and such and, and important lessons that came out of that. But then I shared with them too, uh, you know, the struggles, a little bit of the struggles and how far we've all come and how exciting it is to, to see what they have now. But then I shared with them, I, I went back to the coaches convention. And again, I said, if there was one message I came back empowered was, you deserve what you deserve and don't settle for less. And you're the leaders for tomorrow. You're the strong people, the fighters. You're the, the women that can be in a position, whatever career you are to make changes and your background in sports has well prepared you for that. And go out and be the fighters and don't settle for less and go for what you know you deserve and right because you're well being well trained through your athletic experiences to make the next generation better for everybody. And I think those are the lessons uh, that coaches need to share uh, and educate. So the players do appreciate somewhat where, where they've been, recognize uh, what got them there, but then be challenged to be the leaders for the future. Yeah, I agree. I think they have to be strong and willing to speak out, but they have to have that confidence to speak out, it, you know, meaning coaches now and even senior women administrators, you know, I think of all the female administrators, you know, the Christine Grants, the Donna Lopianos, you know, all of those people. Was it Judy Moore at UCLA? Who was at UCLA? Uh, Bill, uh, no, uh, Billy, uh, Judy Holland. Holland. Judy yeah, Holland. Judy Holland and uh, Anne Marie Rogers at Florida. She was at Florida and then Al or Alabama, then Florida, I think. Um, you know, Barbara Palmer at Florida State, those people that had the strength to say women deserve to be treated better. And I think coaches now just give give your athletes that confidence, that strength, listen to your athletes, uh, because I think the women today are getting to be the, you know, they're very confident young women. And I think that they need to be confident in a worldly sense, not just in a athletic sense, as Judy said. You know, whether they go into politics or medicine or the legal profession or become teachers, you know, they have to have the strength to say, this isn't right. You know, this, this is just not right. And we need to fix this. And uh, hopefully a lot of people then would kind of get behind uh, them. And if they know things that are unequal between, you know, like baseball and softball, they need to speak up so that the coaches know. Because uh, I know with my athletes, you know, they'd come and they go, okay, why are they getting post, you know, game money and we're not for eating? And I'm like, I don't know, but I'll ask. I didn't know that, you know, so, and of course they date the baseball players. So they would know, you know, what they were getting. I wouldn't know because nobody would tell me. So, you know, I think kind of if they can help their coaches, you know, educate with what's going on and coaches can support them. Yeah, they've got those student athletic councils now. 
you know, where they can bring up things. But uh, yeah, having the strength is always tough sometimes. Absolutely. Well, thank you both so much for your time. I do hope we get to see you both in San Antonio and in the future and in the big, big 40th in Louisville. Um, we got a big, uh, big Hall of Fame fun reunion starting to plan that in the work. So hopefully we get to see you at both of those. We'll be there. Yes. Well, thank you ladies Very so cool. much for taking okay. the time and, and being a part of this. We truly appreciate it. Mm -hmm.